Welcome to Revenue Talks, the show where we get real about what it takes to build pipeline and drive expansion as a go-to-market team. I'm Justin Keller, the Vice President of Revenue Marketing at Drift, and on this show, I'm here talking to folks across the entire go-to-market organization, which means marketing, sales, and customer success, about how they use conversations, technology, and cross-functional alignment to build more pipeline and drive expansion. Because revenue, it's everyone's business now. Hey, everybody. Justin here. Welcome back to Revenue Talks. John Brzezinski is joining me on the show today. John is the VP of Global Product Marketing at Searchmetrics, which is a global provider of search data, of software, and of consulting solutions. John's got many years building out product marketing programs at a variety of companies, both large, small, global, and regional. Um, And we're going to share some of the biggest lessons he's learned from these experiences. So let's get into it. John, thank you for joining me on the show. Um, Before we get into all things product marketing, uh, two things here I think that are both firsts on Revenue Talks. One, I think you're our first product marketer, so that's amazing. And you're definitely our first international guest, so congrats. You're coming to us from Berlin, correct? That is correct, yeah. And how, how, how are you finding Berlin this time of year? No, this is wonderful, um, you know, and you know, thanks very much for having me. I'm glad to represent the uh, the global community, and absolutely glad to represent product marketing. Um, but for the, for those out there who have never been to Berlin, I absolutely recommend it. It's a beautiful city, very cosmopolitan, a great place to be. I absolutely co-sign that. Berlin is. I've had some wild adventures in Berlin. Really, really beautiful city. Really fun city. Um, and really, just like, just so much to explore there. So, um, I'm I'm glad to hear that. You moved there for Search Metrics, correct? I did. I did. Uh, this uh, just this past April. Uh, my me, my wife, our daughter, and a pair of corgis. We packed up and made the great journey across the Atlantic. Um, and you know, it's been a really good transition for me. Uh, you know, it's a global team, but HQ is here in Berlin, and it's filled with a lot of really smart people uh, who care a lot about helping enterprise clients drive more revenue from organic search. Love it. And wh- how, how's the adjustment been for the Corgis? <laughs> uh, <laughs> actually, really good. Um, Berlin is also a very dog-friendly city. Uh, the the suburb of DC where we were before, uh, there weren't that many dogs around, um, so they get a lot of interactions with a lot of different animals, and you know, they tend to be pretty popular. That's good to know. Okay, are they picking up any German? Are you picking up German? Uh, yes. So uh, for me, it's you know it's essential. I mean, you know, if you're living in a place, it's uh, certainly helpful if you speak the local language. Uh, the dogs uh, understand some English, but typically ignore commands that they don't want to reply to in English, and they tend to do the same in German. Perfect. Okay. Um, good segue, because one of the things I want to ask you about is, you know, as product mo- in product marketing, you're responsible for the messaging, how you're conveying the value of the product. And that means different things to different people, right? Like, you know, you may be conveying one thing to your corgi, you may be conveying another thing to a global market. Both are received differently. So how... What has your approach been, or how have you found success in scaling message across across global markets? Okay, great question. Um, the The real answer is it depends, uh, which uh, may, maybe sounds a little bit like a cop out, but it isn't because it really does depend. Um, the, the The first and most important question, of course, and honestly, the only thing that matters with developing messaging is what your target segments, plural, are going to respond to, right? Uh, so that's really the question. What, you know, what do they care about? What's going to make a difference to them? So before you can even think about scaling any kind of message, you, know, you have to do the homework and put in the hard work to find out you know, what's really going on with them. Um, you know, what are the pain points? What do they like about their jobs? What makes them happy? What makes them unhappy? And when you do that kind of homework, what you'll find is, in my experience at least, people honestly are more similar than they are dissimilar. Uh, the job really defines um, what people care about. Uh, but as you're doing the homework, you know you may find that certain parts of the world um, respond to different phrasings differently. Uh, some parts of the world you know, might uh, prefer things that are a little bit uh, more assertive or uh, positively spun, whereas other parts of the world uh, might regard that as being too over the top. Uh, So really it comes down to doing the homework and then identifying where and if there are significant differences. If there are, okay, 
well, then that that's the, that uh, drives the directions that you roll things out in. Yeah. Can you tell me about the homework though? What does that entail? So maybe yeah, maybe okay. um, preface the question: how many how many markets are you in globally? And then what is the process of kind of like just you know segmenting those out and figuring out what resonates with what market? Sure. Uh, so we serve primarily uh, enterprise e-commerce corporations, which tend to have global footprints themselves, uh, but whose global marketing teams and the teams that are running the websites tend to be based in you know, wherever corporate HQ is. So for us, that tends to be Europe and it tends to be North America. Uh, so, you know, when we're talking about doing, you know, the homework, by which I just mean market research, right, uh, right. for us, it's, it t tends to be, you know, EMEA, mostly Europe and North America, mostly the U.S. Um, but what we have are fairly well-defined job titles uh, for the people who are either using the software or interacting with the consultants or analyzing the data. And in many ways, more importantly, the people above them who are making the, the larger strategic decisions for the company. Uh, so once you know who you're going after, which, of course, you know, most most of your listeners do have fairly well defined uh, ICPs and fairly well defined job titles. You know what I'm talking about really is just developing the personas, okay. um, and you know, there are a number of techniques that people have used. Um, my favorites are honestly some of the oldest ones in the books. Um, I'm a big fan of surveys. I'm a big fan of interviews, um, but there's a lot of detail, of course, that goes you know that, that goes into those. You've got surveys, you've got interviews. Um, how do you go about indexing that, right? Like, uh, is there, do you have a, like a spreadsheet somewhere on your computer where it's like, okay, in the German version of the website, we say this, in the Dutch version, we say that. How does that actually, like, how do you organize all that? And then how do you measure that, if, if at all? Oh, good grief. Okay, so those are both huge questions. Um, so let me start with the you know, the actual personas and defining the messages as they ought to be used. Uh, so yes, we do in fact have a repository that define starting with similarities, things that you know we believe to be globally the same for you know, say an executive who works in e-commerce or uh, you know, the leader of a search engine optimization team or the CMO at, a, at an e-commerce company, right? Uh, starting with the similarities for those job types and then breaking out where we see differences, which sometimes actually have more to do with the way that the company itself is organized than the part of the world that, uh, that they're operating in. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, the SEO teams uh, traditionally used to be part of the marketing organization. And so what that typically means then is they work uh, very tightly with uh, the rest of the marketing teams, with the digital marketers, uh, with the content teams, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but they may not work as closely with the people who actually run the e-commerce engine that the company is based around. Uh, one trend that we've seen at larger companies is actually moving SEO over to the e-commerce uh, part of the organization itself. Uh, if the business is, you know, if the website is the store, then it makes mm -hmm. sense for the people who are optimizing the website to work in the same team as people who work in the store. What does that mean? Well, predictably, it means that they have great relationships with the devs and the engineers and the people who are working on the technical side of things. Uh, they tend to have tighter relationships with the people who are running the product lines. But since they're no longer in the marketing team, now all of a sudden there are issues with communication across over to the people who are running the rest of digital marketing, paid search, for example. Uh, and so, yes, in fact, we do have these documents and then uh, we work out what we believe to be primary differences between, really it comes down to, for us anyway, the larger differences between uh, you know, a European uh, message versus a more U.S.-based message. Uh, and then, of course, we absolutely test these. We test them in email, in ads, on the, the website itself, and most importantly with our sales teams where we discuss uh, messaging and we discuss experiments with messaging all the time. Okay, John, this is the closest to an, a CIA agent, a marketer I've ever talked to has been. I feel like you are kind of like, you're, you're, you're just out there collecting information on all these different populations, centralizing it, giving it to your agents, um, which is very cool. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like you're kind of like, 
you know, you, you should wear a, a trench coat and like a, you know, a, a, a hat pulled down. <laughs> no, okay. So, so that's a fair question. But, but I mean, the really cool thing is, for me, for me, so what, what I find to be really personally, professionally rewarding is just you know, really understanding your segments, right? Because you know, anyone who's, do, who's done interviews... You, you ask people, what do you like about your job? What do you dislike about your job? And the answers you get tend to be pretty boring. It tends to be stuff that you already know, especially the things about like, what do you dislike about your job? Um, but if you can get under someone's, you know, if you can get under their armor, if you can get through the kind of professional words that they give you during an interview, you know, get past the stuff that they're saying because they think that's what you want to hear, that's when things get really interesting. And I love this stuff. And in particular, I like it uh, working at this company right now because what we're doing is cool. Um, uh, people think about SEO, if, if they think about it at all, um, they think about it the way that it used to be 10 years ago, when yeah. honestly, a lot of it was just tricking the search engines yep. into showing your page, right? Um, but, but the reality is, uh, people are telling Google three and a half billion times a day what they want. They're asking questions. They're saying, you know, I'm interested in this product in this color. And if you can collect that data globally and then analyze it down to the local level, what you're looking at is real world demand data. Yeah. And communicating this, you know, this, this purest form of demand data out to the head of SEO, the head of digital marketing, the person who's actually making um, product decisions, the person who's running the, sh um, the online store who has to decide what are we going to what are we going to be featuring this month or that month. And, you know, especially the CMO who if the CMO is not currently in a country that's in a recession, they're in a country that's entering a recession. Yep. Communicating that that stuff in a way that really makes sense to them. I mean, that's that's genuinely, genuinely rewarding to me. That is very cool. And I'm glad I'm so glad to hear that for you. Let's um for the people listening, can you give a little bit of market research 101? So when you talk about like getting under their skin or kind of getting past what what they want you to hear, what are some of the techniques you you use to to normalize that and to get more revealing information out of them? I'm going to work with with a couple of assumptions here. Uh, one is that uh, the person doing this research has some ideas of you know, what these people are already like, um, but that you have some really big questions. And this is maybe especially useful for any of your listeners who are targeting a market that's maybe going through some kind of transition, maybe especially given the current economic climate where you know, we're coming out of the world of nonstop change in the pandemic years. Um, it's still kind of pandemic years, but not really. But now we're looking at global recession, so things are in flux. Um, I'm going to go back to the, my two favorite techniques of interviews and, uh, and surveys. Um, also, just kind of you know, set, set the stage in case any of the listeners you know, haven't done this in a while. Re quick reminder that interviews are good for, for going deep. Interviews are good for your qualitative information. Whereas the surveys, this is your quantitative. This is where you're going to uh, you know, get answers to hypotheses with statistical significance. Um, okay, so, so let's start out with, with the interviews. Um, if you're building a messaging stack, you really need to understand just some basic things about a given persona. Uh, you need to understand what gives them satisfaction at their jobs. You need to understand you know, what causes them pain at their jobs. Um, and you also need a better understanding of how they interact with other people in the company. And in particular, what their boss holds them accountable for. So you're going to ask them those questions. But here's the issue. Um, most people, when they're doing an interview, their, uh, you know, their affective filter is ramped way up. Um, they don't know you. Um, they don't feel particularly comfortable. They also want to look good, right? Um, you know, despite the fact that you will have assured them that their name won't be used anywhere, you know, it's still a professional environment. You want to look good. Okay, so a couple techniques. Um, always start with a warm up, and the only goal for the warm up is just to get them relaxed, to help lower that effective filter, make them feel like they're talking with a friend. 
Um, and a great question for this is something along the lines of, hey, you know, I saw I saw your work, you know, I saw your resume on LinkedIn. You've had an interesting career. Can you just tell me how you got to the job that you're at now? I like this partly because it's easy, also partly because everyone likes talking about themselves. And once they kind of get going, you can usually see it in the body language. Um, they'll start to sit a little bit lower. Um, they'll start to feel a little bit more friendly with you. And that's when you can start moving into you know, slightly deeper questions. Um, you want to know what they like about the job? Ask them. Um, you know, tell me what you like about your job. And they'll tell you. Uh, the only thing is, though, what they'll tell you at first is going to be relatively basic, high level, not particularly connected to emotions, um, the basic stuff. Let them do that. But then push them a little bit farther. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to just ask why. Um, so they said they like this. So that's really interesting. You know, tell me more about that. You know, what do you really like about that? Now, the second answer that you get is still going to be relatively surface level. So just don't let it go. Keep digging. Um, depending on the person you're talking to, you can actually even ask them, um, you know, so, so when this happens, this thing you've said that you like for this reason, you know, how does that actually make you feel? Once they get used to the idea that you're looking for, you know, more emotional, uh, you know, deeper things, and after the first time that they say it, they'll start to feel more comfortable. Uh, then, of course, you need to, you know, tell them, all right, I've asked you what you like, then, you know, clearly I'm going to ask what you don't like. Uh, this one is honestly even harder, and I find this is especially harder for people based in the U.S., where no one wants to suggest that they have problems at work, no one wants to suggest that there's something that they don't do very well or something they don't like doing. Um, so keep asking why. And another thing that you can do is let them keep talking, and if they stop talking, Then inserting a pause there, yep. inserting a pause, <laughs> people get uncomfortable and they want to fill it. Yep. Let them, let them give them, give them a little bit of silence, right? Yep. Um, ah, here, here's another one though. Um, and I'm actually going to give this one verbatim. So we'll pretend that I'm interviewing okay. you. Um, I said, okay, cool. Thanks for all that. Um, uh, so an expression that I've heard recently actually is called the, uh, the Sunday scaries. Have, have you heard of that? Um, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the, okay, so Sunday afternoon, you know, people start to get a little bit anxious about what's coming the next Monday. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that anything at your job could actually, you know, cause you anxiety. Um, but if it did, uh, what would those things be? And what I like about that is first it sets it up in something a little bit lighthearted. And then it's also not saying that anything actually makes you anxious. Yeah. Um, but, you know, hypothetically speaking, one more. Um, and I like saving this towards the end um, because it requires a little bit more analysis and it also requires um, the person to be really relaxed. Um, one thing that I like to understand is the way that people interact with other job functions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of just asking them, so tell me about your relationship with, you know, with this team, with that team, um, I actually ask them about stereotypes. And start from the outset by just saying, I don't want to hear about any specific person who you actually work with, but let's go down the list of the other functional groups that you interact with, and let's just talk about stereotypes. So those people in paid search, those people in social, those people in PR, you know, those people, what are they like? I find that people are taken a little bit off guard by the question and give you really honest answers. And by interviewing people from each of those different functional groups and asking them about their stereo, the, the stereotypes that exist about all of the other functional groups, you end up getting this really cool 360 picture of yeah. how, everyone, how everyone functions or sometimes dysfunctions together. And so you look at that composite and you kind of say, okay, mm -hmm. these five departments shared on the sixth department, you know, many different adjectives, but this one showed up in all six. And then that becomes yes. kind of a, like, almost a true stereotype, right? Like, that's an identifiable trend that everyone thinks about them. Fascinating. Hey, it's Elizabeth, the producer of the Drift Podcast Network. 
I hope you're enjoying this episode of Revenue Talks. If you're looking for even more go-to-market best practices, check out our ebook, GTM Lab. You'll get go-to-market hot takes and secrets from the industry's brightest minds on how to ignite every phase of your strategy, giving you even more ways to energize your marketing and sales efforts. Give it a read at drift.ly slash gtmbook. Now, back to the show. And, and what I love is it almost doesn't matter what's really true. The only thing that matters is what is perceived to yes. be true. You know? Yes. Perception is reality. And that's so, I mean, and that's one of those things that I think marketers get either hung up on or take too liberally, right? And kind of just get like way, way um, hopped up on their own hype. Um, which is interesting. And so it's really, you know, market research is not about finding cold hard facts. It's about finding what the perception is and then messaging towards Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Wow. John, I, that, that CIO thing, CIA thing rather, was kind of a throwaway joke, but now I'm actually, you know, I hope I don't blow your cover, but I think that you may actually be in the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> living, living in Berlin, um, practicing interrogation techniques, it's all such cool stuff that I've not thought about or talked about before. This is fascinating. So, okay. You are, um, you, you, what's, you've got now a, a giant stack, a tome of market research that is relevant across um, a global set of marketplaces. We've talked a lot about how that may function online, but not where the rubber meets the road, right? Where, where you're actually giving that to your field team, your sales force, what have you. What is that process like of, of dispersing or disseminating such like a variety of information's kind of got like a common nucleus, but then has kind of all these different flavors surrounding it. How do you effectively get that out there, communicate it the right way and make sure that that is then being communicated again, the, the right way? Yeah. So um, what I'm about to say is going to be really familiar to any of your listeners who are also in product marketing, because uh, the relationship between product marketing and the sales teams, uh, whether it's for new business or renewal business, uh, is one of the most important relationships and one of the easiest to get wrong that exists. Uh, so for starters, before we even talk about rolling it out, uh, this first-hand market research um, that we're doing, we're also doing with the sales teams themselves. I mean, it's you know, axiomatic that they are out there in market all the time. And if they're really good at their jobs, they're also experimenting with you know, different ways of talking about things all the time. So you've absolutely got to collect information from the teams broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is using you know, very similar techniques of both interviews and surveys so that everyone can contribute. Um, and then what that means is when you are, you know, when you've done the final analyses and you've you know, agreed to these are the most important things, here's all of the additional detail and color. When you start rolling it out, you can um, be honest and say, this isn't just my opinion. Uh, this was collected from all of you, as well as surveys in which we had you know, X hundred respondents, as well as interviews with people, if you had these job titles at these types of companies. This is, in fact, nobody's individual opinion. This is the way that it is. Yep. Uh, the actual logistics of getting the message out, I mean, this is as varied as there are you know, varied companies. But my general suggestion for anyone who needs to communicate with sales teams you know, for anything, whether it's messaging or anything else, is more than one method is best. Yes. Uh, if you can get it out during a meeting, great. Get it out during a meeting. You've got a dedicated Slack channel, push it through that dedicated Slack channel. You've got regular emails that you send to the sales teams, put it in the regular emails that you send to the sales teams. And then also bear in mind that people who are out there selling, they don't have, excuse me, they do have exactly the same amount of mental attention as everyone else in the world, which is to say, we're all busy. And so if they forget about something that you told them two months ago, yeah, it's because they've got other things on their mind. They're thinking about this deal. They're thinking about the next deal. So and a hugely important thing for product marketers to do is keep communicating, keep communicating, keep communicating. If someone forgets, not a problem. Tell them again. Yeah. I think that has become, you know, I've learned this is a hard and fast rule. There is no silver bullet to communicating to a sales team, to enabling them. It is just consistency and volume, right? You cannot over communicate mm -hmm. enough, which 
is frustrating to so many marketers. I know, like I sent that to you three times. It was in the Slack. Why didn't you go back and reference it? Doesn't matter. You have to keep, you have to just keep that fire hose on full blast at all times. Absolutely. And look, they need to keep in mind so many factors about yep. this deal and that deal and the other deal. And I would prefer that they keep those things front of mind. If they forget where a case study is, I can find them that case study. Yes. Which is, yes, this was no shade was meant for our friends in sales, right? They're busy. They're closing deals. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, I think this is just a PSA for the marketers, you know. Your job is, you know, like it or not, in service of the sales team and, and keeping that communication up is very, very crit critical. Um, now, what about how marketing comports into campaigns, right? So do you, does the does the ball start rolling with you and then head over to your campaign or demand gen team based on the messaging frameworks that you've established? Or how does that work with you guys? Sure. Uh, so as with a lot of stuff, once we start talking about real campaigns, uh, good grief. Every company truly is different and everyone is in a different situation. And what it really comes down to is, you know, the overall company strategy. So I'll speak to a company strategy that is primarily focused on uh, target accounts. It's primarily focused on outbound campaigns around those specific accounts. Um, start with the goals. And in fact, what are the sales team's goals? You know, globally, by region, down to the individual SDR and AE, what do they need to accomplish? Um, and then based around those goals and based on, then on the kinds of KPIs that marketing can be held responsible for to help meet those goals, go and talk to your leaders. Uh, sometimes it might be best to you know, start at the, at the regional level. Sometimes you might start with a group of people who are down at the, at the country level, but start with them. And uh, my recommendation to marketers who are planning on campaigns is to not roll into a conversation with sales teams with your strategy or, heaven forbid, your tactics already fully worked out. It needs to be a conversation. You've probably already got some pretty good ideas, but still let it be a conversation because the more that you work with your sales teams, the more your sales teams will work with you. And... Ultimately, that's the goal is for sales and marketing to be working together, because at the end of the day, all that we're doing is driving more revenue for the company. So start with conversations. Um, and then for each set, each step along the way, whether it's goals or strategies or down to tactics, get sign off, get it in writing. So that way, the next level of you know, brainstorming or planning is just that much easier. Um, I do also like to be able to have conversations with some of the, you know, some of the better AEs, especially if there's a, a head of, of account executives. Uh, the same goes for SDRs. But ultimately, it needs to be sales leadership who buys in, signs off and says, yes, we agree. This is the way that we, sales and marketing together, is going to go after these this set of target accounts. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Like, make it. It's a partnership at the outset, but then it's a contract at the end, right? That's and that's I found that <laughs> no matter what it is, right? Like uh, account selection, messaging, you know, yeah. who's going to yeah. do what yeah. is that's the way to do it, right? Um, gosh, John, this has been an education, sales and marketing alignment, like uh, market research, <laughs> how to scale this out. I am mind is blown. I've got one more question for you today, and this mm -hmm. is the signature revenue talks question, and it is this. What's the one thing that you're doing this year to help accelerate revenue for your company? Sure. So for us right now, it is um, moving towards a better framework for not marketing qualified leads, um, but marketing qualified accounts. Uh, so for us, this is you know, really it's exactly what we were just talking about. It's working together with sales to make sure that we're able to capture every interaction that every lead has uh, with everything that we're doing, whether it's you know, a phone call from an SDR or a webinar from marketing, uh, that we're able to capture that and really turn that into actionable insights at the account level. I love it. All right. John Brzezinski, or should I say Agent Brzezinski, um, this has been an awesome conversation. Everybody, 
Thank you so much for listening. John Brzezinski is the Global VP of Product Marketing at Search Metrics. What an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. M literally, mind is blown. Um, this has been awesome. I appreciate you. Hey, thanks very much. It's been a, pl been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to Revenue Talks. If you liked this episode, please consider leaving a review wherever you're listening. You can connect with me on Twitter at Justin Keller and the entire Drift Podcast Network at, at Drift Podcasts. Remember, revenue, it's everyone's business now.